A very good morning. On behalf of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, I welcome you to the second eponymous lecture session, the KT Dolakia eponymous lecture. This lecture is on a science related to orthopedics, which is always chaired by the vice president of the BOS and chosen lecturer or chosen speaker is someone who's chosen amongst many thousands by the members of the Bombay Orthopedic Society. So to chair the session, may I now invite the Honorable Vice President of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, Dr. Satish Mutha, and I hand over the proceedings to him. Good morning friends, on behalf of the Bombay Orthopedic Society, I extend a very warm welcome to you all on this Saturday morning. To deliver this prestigious Dr. K.T. Dolakia eponymous lecture, we are honored and blessed to have another living legend in the field of radiology, a pioneer of neuroradiology and intervent interventional radiology in this country. May I request our Honorable Secretary, Dr. Neeraj Bijlani, to escort Dr. Ravi Ramakantan, ex-professor and head department of radiology, KEM, to the dais. This august audience here uh, does not need any introduction to Dr. K.T. Dholakia. Amongst many firsts and innovations to his credit, he is regarded as the father of arthroplasty and joint replacement in India. A teacher par excellence with a legendary academic and professional career, his contribution to Indian orthopedics is unparalleled and unmatched. Sir was associated with the Department of Orthopedics at KEM as the professor and HOD from 1952 to all the way 1974. And during his tenure, the department reached unparalleled heights of professional excellence. Sir was decorated with many, prof uh, many uh, presidential positions during his career, including the Bombay Orthopedic Society, the IOA, ASI, SICOT, and many others. Sir gave, uh, has given several orations and keynote lectures all over the country and abroad. And this had put India in a very respectable position on the world orthopedic map. Sir was honored the prestigious Padma Shri Award in 1973, apart from various other awards like the Dhanvantri, the Perkine Medal given by the Czechoslovakian Academy of Biomedical Sciences, and the International Master Surgeons Award by the ICS. This is a very uh, pre uh, precious photograph of Sir in 1973 receiving the Padma Shri Award with the then Prime Minister and President. Sir was elevated to the very, very coveted presidential chair of the SICOT in 1978, the first Asian to don this chair in 50 years of existence of this organization. And he was the person who brought Sikot to India for the first time in 1982. There are a lot more things and the list is endless. But this is what we all remember first. The first Chanley's total hip replacement done by Sir in 1972 at Bombay Hospital. Against many, many odds. 
and this was a turning chapter in the history of orthopedics in india this is an x ray of the patient with a 72 22 year follow up and a very happy patient doing all kind of exercises and yoga the list is endless but we must move on and to deliver this very prestigious eponymous lecture we have another living legend dr ravi ramakantan who needs very little introduction sir was the he has been a km student all throughout his undergrad postgrad he did his md in radiology in 1980 with the first ever distinction in radiology he was then the professor and head of the department from 1919 to 2010 and during his tenure lot of milestones were achieved by the department like the first neuro radiology interventional radiology departments and so on currently sir is honorary consultant at the radio with the department of radiology at kokila bay trust me at this point i was very subtly warned and sincerely requested by sir not to mention any single point more than this about his achievements and accolades during our two months of interaction with him we were completely floored by the humbleness of this gentleman we somehow managed to convince him to let us share a few sir is the only indian visiting professor at the brighams and women's hospital at the prestigious harvard's business school harvard medical school he is the first international visiting scholar at the radiological society of north america he is the founding president of the indian society of the neuro radiology he has been awarded the best medical teacher award by the university of mumbai he has been twice awarded the lifetime achievement award by the indian society of vascular and interventional radiology he has lot of philanthropic inclinations too and he has been awarded the karma yogi award by the bombay medical aid foundation and he also is the founding president of the indian society of medical humanities to his credit sir has more than 70 papers in index journals and more than 25 orations and in one of the most influential online poll in radiology the aunt mini sir was judged as the most influential radiological educator in 2006 so with this i proudly welcome dr ravi ramakantan to deliver the eponymous kt dholakia lecture good morning and uh, i'm not taking off my mask um no wearing this medallion is a very proud moment because it represents a gsi somebody from my alma mater and uh, though it has been a great privilege uh, to be associated with this lecture i must say that the subject that i'm going to be talking to you about is not in any sense mainstream orthopedics um but a subject in which orthopedic surgeons are closely involved but in a very peripheral way confusing words but you will understand as we go along now i'm going to make an unusual uh, beginning people in radiology know that i do all sorts of funny things in my lecture and this is what i'm going to do in the first two slides i want all of you to read these four lines carefully and that will take what 20 seconds 30 seconds and then close your eyes i mean close your eyes means close your eyes think of the last time you manage a patient who would fit fit into this diagnosis this is a long poem written by a 9 year old american kid so you have to read those lines close your eyes there's a lot of uh, impact in closing your eyes i cannot get into that think of a patient like this that you may have treated in the recent past distant past 
even virtue lok when i use the word virtue lok for residents and that too has a lot of implications so don't get disturbed i keep saying virtue lok virtue lok and how you manage that patient so let's uh, do that please close your eyes i'll wait for 15 seconds for you to go through the thought process uh, i really cannot see all of you closing your eyes or not people cheat i'm sure orthopedic surgeons cheat more than others as far as closing eyes is concerned but uh, once you are done with that exercise i will move on with this and hopefully connect what i told you now towards the end of the lecture let's move on so bumpy bones and i'm sure most of you may that this is something to do with exostosis but it is bumpy bones in plural and that makes a big deal of difference because this is probably the official ecclesia and all of you know that exostosis on one hand and diaphyseal ecclesia are two different things altogether and make a lot of difference to the patient outcomes so the topic i have for you is skeletal dysplasia uh, i will go through a little bit of diagnosis but towards the end i will connect it with what i feel and what i have seen first hand the problem of skeletal dysplasia the patients come to me from here and there so i get to see patients i insist on seeing human beings in front of me when they come with skeletal dysplasia it makes a whole lot of difference i have experiences of interacting with them over 30 40 years and that is what more than the radiology of it which you can read from books that i want to share with you and that will happen in a major way towards the end of this talk but the first half how much time do i have is that right 37 minutes or somebody is cheating how much time do i have 37 minutes good i have this uh, reputation of not finishing my lectures in any decent manner but here i have to because this is a narration so let's get going now <clears throat> arthur c clark was twice chairman of the british interplanetary society and a writer of fact and fiction and he said something very profound this is what he said the very concept of interplanetary travel was not possible till you realize that there are other planets and that is the issue with skeletal dysplasia now there are three or four groups of people who handle skeletal dysplasia the genetic people are one and then you have the pediatricians and then the endocrine people now when i tell you that when you look at radiographs and wonder if it is or look at patients first and whether wonder whether the patient has a skeletal dysplasia or not the immediate response is what is the big deal you look at the patient and you know that the patient has skeletal dysplasia that's not true that's what the pediatricians and the endocrinologists tell me the those people will send me radiographs and the first question they ask sir is this skeletal dysplasia so that is big deal the growth hormone levels are normal everything else is normal and they are not sure if this is a skeletal dysplasia or not excuse me this can be very irritating for you to see that i'm adjusting my mask again and again so that is the first part that i want to cover how do you tell that what you are looking at is skeletal dysplasia and you have to believe me just looking at the patient just looking at the labs it's not possible always to tell one from the other uh the good thing about this is that orthopedic surgeons are used to looking at bones all the time so you can tell normal from abnormal fairly easily and there are two words that you have to learn here one is the texture of the bone it's like texture of the fiber your smooth fiber and your coarse fiber and the density which is much easier you have white bones and your black bones so these are the two things that you look at to tell dysplasia from say metabolic bone disease or metastasis or whatever uh let me show you this and i hope can we get the lights down here there's too much light radiologists like to work in darkness yeah that's nice keep it lower still 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 yeah that's fine thank you 
So the image on your extreme left has this type of appearance. Call it what you will, I'll tell you the name for it. The one in the center is the one that you're used to seeing all the time. You have some trabecular bone, you have some black stuff in between, and this one in the center is normal bone. And on your left, you can see that this is featureless. In all of radiology, in all of uh, science that deals with this condition, this is called ground glass appearance. There is no feature, it's featureless. And anyone in orthopedics related subject tells you that there is a ground glass appearance, it means that it is fibrous dysplasia. No DD at all. So use the word fibrous dysplasia, use the word ground glass when you want to talk about fibrous dysplasia. So this damn thing is smooth. I'm sorry, I use exploratories easily during my lecture. So this one is FD. On the other hand, compare this with the one I used to have a <clears throat> teacher of surgery, and this I'm telling you for Bachulok, uh, C.V. Patel, he passed away a couple of years back. And he was a brilliant bedside teacher, brilliant, the best bedside teacher I have said, I've seen in my life. And he would say, boy, he always used to say, boy, I don't know how he addressed girls, but boy, God has given two sides to compare. It's so profound. So when you're not sure what's happening, you see the opposite side. Even for example, if somebody was talking about supracondylar fractures, sometimes you can't tell, for example, the so-called little leaguer's elbow. That medial epicondyle is just a little bit away, so you take the X-ray of the opposite side. Anyway, so two sides to compare. And here you can compare, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah, you can compare the normal with the abnormal, the normal that's there in your temporal lobes. And this is coarse trabecular pattern. By and large, with some unusual exceptions, coarse trabecular pattern means metabolic bone disease. On the other hand, the image on your left, you have a smooth pattern, which usually means, almost always means, you have a skeletal dysplasia. So this is one way of telling. And this is not easy for everybody who's young, not no gray hair, so on and so forth, but this is easy. Akash will tell you, Akash is a ward boy in our department. He will tell you that these bones are abnormal. They have increased density. One of the things that characterizes common, meta I'm sorry, common dysplasia is increased bone density. You could also get increased bone density in other conditions. Fluorosis is one classical example, but in fluorosis you get ligamental ligament calcification which is extremely unusual, in fact, does not occur in skeletal dysplasia. So you look at this fellow here, you have a child's x-ray, you have no ligament calcification at all, you can look at pelvis, you can look at what you want, but there is no ligament calcification, so this is not fluorosis. This could be metastasis from one of the common uh, osteoblastic metastasis, three-year-old children don't get prostatic carcinoma. So looking at that, and also in skeletal dysplasia, all bones are affected. Almost always all bones are affected, but in metastasis that doesn't happen. There's a pattern of affection of the central skeleton or sometimes of the peripheral skeleton, not all bones are affected. And this is easy to understand. So, so far we have sort of given an overall idea of how to tell in a difficult condition. You look at the patient most of the time, you know that this is skeletal dysplasia. You do the labs, you know that this is not metabolic bone disease. And in difficult condition, when you look at this, and if you're a radiologist, you look at images, you have to tell without looking at the patient what's going on. So we will talk about this one condition first, and I must warn you, during the course of this lecture, I will use big, big names, yeah? Those who of you who are young and not used to it have to bear with me. You have to go back and read what these are, if you will, Others who are more senior would have heard of this name. So these names can be confuse, confusing and it can be mind boggling. What the hell is going on, such big names, okay? So this is one. <clears throat> now this is one of the important slides. As we go along, I'll keep telling you which is important. Now, I must say, if you, there are rotten necks, don't throw, me, throw it at me, that orthopedic surgeons have very poor sense 
of radiation safety as a rule. It's unfortunate. They don't take care of themselves. They don't take care of the anesthesiologists. They don't take care of the patients by and large. There may be others who are exception to the rule, but I must say this because I have seen them work. So what happens is that a child comes with skeletal dysplasia, you do head to foot, AP lateral, AP lateral, AP lateral. You do one set, the patient goes to another hospital, somebody does AP lateral, AP lateral, and it goes on like that. Radiation is neither cheap nor safe. So there is a rule that you have to follow in these small children as far as radiation safety is concerned. This is an approximate list. Okay, this is what I do. You don't have to follow that. You just use your common sense. Do the minimum that is required to make a diagnosis. Do not do. Now, especially residents have this habit of writing epilateral, epilateral. Don't do that. So do minimum that is required is something that you learn from experience. And when you know that something is not required, don't ask for that radiology. Before digital radiology came in, it was, it, it was real fun. So the first set of radiographs is asked by the houseman. The registrar says, Are, I want one more for myself, for my teaching files. The tutor or the lecturer says, and the boss says, hey boy, please make one set and take it to my car and leave it there. It gets extreme. So the patient gets irradiated three, four times. With digital radiology, that doesn't happen. And that is a good thing. And this is important because there is important learning in radiation safety. So this is the next slide. No, 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 no. Be commonsensical when you ask for radiographs on the small children who are likely to be x-rayed several times in their life. Okay, now we start with a few conditions and how to distinguish one from the other and why. That's important. Why? I tell all but you look. Keep asking why all your life. From eighth standard, you stopped asking why. All that you do is tick where applicable. MCQ, MCQ. What day is today? You don't know it's Saturday. But if you're told today is Saturday or Monday or Tuesday, you'll click Saturday. So the truth is that our postgraduate students have stopped asking why. And here, for example, why is it important to tell the difference between one on the left and the one on the right? Most of you can make out that the skull base is sclerosed. On the image on your left, is a condition which is lethal. The image on your right is a condition where patients have near normal lives. It's important to tell the difference. The one on your left, you can see that, I'm sorry, the one on your right, the fontanelles are open. You can see that. The fontanelles are open and the sutures are wide open. The one on your left, is that right? Yeah, one on your left. Is sutures are not as much open. There are no uh, vermian bones. I mean, you may go back and read what are vermian bones, W-O-R-M-I-A-N. Not worm-like, but there's a reason why they are called open, I mean, vermian bones. So the difference between the image on your left and the image on your right, the one on your right has large sutures, open fontanelles, and vermian bone, and is called Brace yourself, pycnodysostosis. But you look, go back and ask your wherever, your Google, why is it called pycnodysostosis? So this is called pycnodysostosis. This is called osteopetrosis. Easy, petrous bone, sclerose bone. Comes from Latin, so it's easy to remember this. The big difference is the sutures. Now what happens in these patients is that the bones are so sclerosed, it involves the medullary cavity, the child becomes anemic, and they develop hepatosplenomegaly. And I'm stressing this because this is important from the point of view of prognosis, and also about uh, <clears throat> the way they are transmitted down generations. The worst problem is that because the bones are so sclerosed and keep sclerosing, and you must, <clears throat> you must again ask why they're sclerosing dysplasia. That's because the osteoclasts are lazy. They don't do what they are supposed to do. All our functions, all our functions, whether I'm moving this hand or talking, depends on two things. One that makes it do it, the one that prevents it from doing it. So phenomenal feedback mechanism and osteoclasts 
are supposed to take out unwanted bone. And again, but you look, you want to know how bone metabolism works or bone histological things work, go back to your library and pick up one book called Histology by Arthur Hamm and read the bone part from there. There is no other book. I don't think there's any orthopedic book that discusses bone formation and bone destruction like Arthur Hamm's textbook of histology. It's not easily available, but I'm sure your libraries have it or your anatomy departments will have it. It's fun. It's written beautifully. Your whole concept of even fracture healing becomes very, very beautiful with that description. Okay, now where? So bone sclerosis, the optic foramina get compressed. The children become blind. Imagine. Child after child of a mother becomes blind. The <clears throat> internal acoustic meatus get compressed. Children become deaf. The foramen magnum becomes compressed and luckily a few, but surely a few children become quadriplegic. So this is, and besides they're all anemic, this is a lethal dwarfism. On the other hand, pycnodisostosis doesn't do any of these things. They may have fractures, they may have resorption of the terminal phalanges of the hand, they may have bad teeth, but that is a non-lethal dysplasia. Just look at one film, the skull lateral, and you can tell the difference between the two. Now, this is interesting. If you're shown this chest x-ray, I'm sure most of you will miss this finding. Most radiologists will miss this finding. The clavicles are absent. So this one is called cledocranial dysostosis. Cledocranial dysostosis. Looks exactly like the other two. The pycnodysostosis, non-lethal dysplasia, but the inheritance is different. Therefore, you should be able to pick up this one where the clavicles are absent. The people say introduce the elephant in the room. Something is so obvious that we tend to miss it. So the bones are sclerosed, the skull would have looked like pycnodysostosis and the clavicles are missing. The transmission is like <coughs> pycnodysostosis. How do I know all this transmission business? Not because I read it before the lecture, not because I mugged it for the exam, because I've been doing this for a very long time. So there is nothing like whether you're playing basketball and shooting, nothing like practice, practice, practice. So if you don't remember these names and things, do not hesitate to look back at the books and that's a different thing altogether. I tell patients, I don't know what this is, I'll read up and I'll tell you tomorrow. There is no shame in that because you cannot know everything. Now this is a classical radiograph of osteopetrosis where you see large spleen, large liver, I'm sure even orthopedic surgeons can see that in the abdomen and the image on your right <clears throat> is, is beautiful. It's not beautiful for the patient, but we as doctors become insensitive. And this is a beautiful image because it shows how more bone modeling happens. You have this classical bone within bone appearance. Normally you don't see it because the osteoclast will resorb every model. I mean, it's like there's a model of the bone and then more bone and more bone and the older bone gets resorbed. And what you see in real life in normal human beings is just the current bone. But on your right, you can see the small radius, you can see the growth plate, you can see everything. Even in the metacarpals, you can see bone within bone appearance. So if somebody tells you bone within bone appearance, at two o'clock in the morning, you'll say that it is osteopetrosis or pycnodysostosis. So the right image on your right is just to appreciate the beauty of how a bone forms by and by with new bone forming and old bone getting resorbed. There is beauty in that. I mean, um, well, read Arthur Ham and you'll know what this means. Okay, so when I was very early, but you, I was a resident myself, my registrar taught me that these are called as banana fractures. Now, I asked radiology residents, um, they are smart, you know, many of you know that they are the smartest of the smart. In the whole country, they are top of the top. And I asked them, why are they called banana fractures? No response. I hope orthopedic residents are much better. I don't want answers here, but they are like when you break um, a ripe banana, it's very difficult to get a shallow oblique fracture also. You get just uh, transverse fractures and most transverse fractures like this are pathological fractures and one day on two sides, you know obviously that there is syndromic. It's not fall on something, something, something. 
I'm showing these fractures because there's a whole world of literature about how fractures in different skeletal dysplasias heal. Think of what you do when you treat fractures. You do external, <clears throat> you do say, let's say, like old times you do plasters, like new times you do plates, you do intramedullary nails, you do what you want. The healing happens because there are blood vessels, because there is calcium, because there are osteoblasts, and because there are osteoblasts. It's like a wound here. It will not stop bleeding unless your bleeding parameters are normal. Therefore, it's important for you as an orthopedic surgeon to, aware, to be aware of common conditions where bone will heal normally and common conditions where no matter what you do, there is no normal healing. For example, osteogenesis imperfecta. For reason that I don't know, osteogenesis imperfecta heals with exuberant callus formation. So you don't do anything and you have a whole amount of callus. Maybe there is deformity, but then that, that thing will heal. But sclerosing bone dysplasia, no matter what you do, they don't heal. You'll have non-unions. You can stabilize the fracture, but they will maybe heal, break again, maybe heal, break again. So you have these patients with sclerosing bone dysplasia who are fractures after fracture, and you, as an orthopedic surgeon, decide for yourself whether I'm going to be fixing plating, fixing plating, non-union after non-union. So the question you have to ask yourself, what is the right thing to do? Close your eyes and ask yourself, what is the right thing to do? Now these are same things, again transverse fractures, and this is a common radiograph of pelvis with hips and sclerosing bone dysplasia, all three of them, osteopetrosis, pycnodisostosis, cleidocranial dysostosis, I'm telling you the names again and again, maybe something will register here. Manu Kotari used to say, garbage it, garbage out. Maybe that's true, yeah, because these are esoteric conditions. You don't see them often, even in hospital practice, but I hope you will be enthused to go about reading about this simply because it will teach you about what normal bone is all about. Sometimes you do it so much that you stop working and wondering how normal things happen. So, these three skeletal dysplasias are common in our race. And I never tire of saying this. In radiology lectures, I keep saying this again and again, that Indians are not six feet tall. They don't have blue eyes or blonde hair. Our pathology is different from what happens in Caucasians. And we have to be aware of this. Now, our population, the phenotype and the genotype, is one where you get a lot of these three conditions, which is not as common in the Caucasian population. Therefore, all of us who are concerned with bone, no matter who you are, have to be aware of the details of these conditions and practice what is the right thing to do as far as the treatment of this is concerned. I'll come to that towards the end of this lecture. The other thing, so this is one way, a simple way. Bone density is, is more the distribution that I talked to you about. Something may have gone into your, between the <clears throat> ears something for residence. Some of the seniors may already be knowing all this and it may be repeat performance for them. So this is one systematic way of looking at things and coming to a diagnosis. The other is called gestalt, homework for Bachulo. Why is it called gestalt, okay? The other is aunt mini approach, that means this. Some of you may be knowing what this is. If you don't know, this is a lemur. It comes one of the Rodden family. Go watch National Geographic on lemurs. What a beautiful society that is. Completely coordinated society of hundreds of them. Now this is called a lemur. Now once you know that this is called a lemur, you see another one that looks like this, you will say it is a lemur. That's aunt mini radiology, That's, it's, it's here. Image versus image, that's pattern recognition. So this is a lemur, and this is also a lemur. A naughty fellow, he's pointing fingers at you, you didn't know who I was, what the hell. So this is how some radiological diagnosis of uh, skeletal dysplasia is made. You see two or three of them and you say, oh, I have seen this, so this is that. 
and that is an important way of making radiological diagnosis. This is one of them. And I told you about Indian patients versus Western patients, you will not get an image like this in any of your textbook written by Western authors because this is peculiarly Indian. If you are aware of this, this is rickets. Believe it or not, this is so-called healed rickets. You go back in the history of these patients and you'll find x-rays after x-rays where people have treated these patients with tons of vitamin D and calcium. And another thing, please don't throw apples, I mean, rotten eggs at me. My endocrine fellows, I mean, friends, tell me that orthopedic surgeons don't understand vitamin D, whatever the truth be. These people have been treated with tons of vitamin D and this is what they have. Mostly virus angulation of the femur, virus angulation of the tibia. There are no signs for you to tell that this is healed rickets, but this is gestalt. Next time you see a picture like this, virus of the tibia, virus of the femur, this is a sort of healed rickets. And if you want to do osteotomies, correct them, that's your call. I mean, you can decide when to do it, how to do it, so on and so forth. This image is peculiarly Indian, and nobody really knows why this happens and why this type of healing happens in rickets that's something not given in textbooks. Okay, <clears throat> look at this humerus. Most everybody will know that there is bone growing out of bone. But you look, bone growing out of bone, 2 a.m. in the morning is an osteochondroma. 9 o'clock in the morning is an osteochondroma. So this is an osteochondroma, no matter how it looks. It can look bizarre, it may look like what it wants to. But bone going out of bone is an osteochondroma. So to say it's an osteochondroma is akash fallacy. Because you don't see the rest of it. This humerus is short. This humerus is malformed. The modeling is wrong. I mean, you can tell that this is an abnormal humerus. So when you have an osteochondroma in the setting of modeling defect that the word radiology textbooks will use, I still have 10 minutes. It becomes a completely different entity called diaphyseal ecclesia. You can say multiple exostosis, and this is what that poem was about. A child with multiple exostosis usually has diaphyseal ecclesia. Why is that important? Because children with diaphyseal ecclesia, a single osteochondroma can become a chondrosarcoma in about 20% of the cases. One in five. So these have to be watched for life. And it gets transmitted down generations and you have a mother who suffers in silence because child after child is lost to chondrosarcoma if you do not have timely intervention with tumor boards, for example, like we have in Bombay. So it's important to tell the difference between multiple exostosis and diaphyseal ecclesia, the easiest thing to do, because bones in diaphyseal ecclesia have modeling defect like this. You can easily tell. A first year orthopedic resident can tell that there's something wrong with this uh, humerus. So make the difference important. And there's a whole lot of thing involved with counseling patients who have uh, diaphyseal ecclesia. And I took talking about patient care simply because I told you I, I've been very closely involved with um, patients and relatives with diaphyseal ecclesia for 40 years now. 1980 was the first time uh, when I was a lecturer, Dr. Kumta, who was a pediatrician, uh, the one who that established the genetic clinical KM, he said, Ravi, you have to take interest in this because who somebody has to do radiology of skeletal dysplasia. So that's how, because of a pediatrician, I got, a, got interested in something in skeletal dysplasia. I'm just still sweeping the floors because there are three or four people in our country who know vastly more than I do. Okay, now, this is tough, okay? It's a bad film. This is a patient with achondroplasia. Look at what I say, again for Bachulo. I never say it's a case of achondroplasia. It's a patient with something. And you might wonder, what's the big deal? It's something that you have to solve for yourself. What is the difference between saying a patient with diabetes rather than a case of diabetes? Okay. Now, look at the interpedicular distance. Normally, 
as you go down the spine, the interpedicular distance, which is this, let's say I'm showing where it is well seen, keeps on increasing up till you come down to L4. The L4 interpedicular distance is the widest. No exceptions in normal human beings. I'm assuming it's a straight unrotated film, all that masala. Hypo, I'm sorry, achondroplasia is the only condition where L4, now this is good, in medicine there's almost never we say no exception, but this is no exception. It's only in achondroplasia that you have a situation where the interpedicular distance of L4 is smaller than that of L3 and it is a spot diagnosis. You don't need any more radiographs. You look at the patient, you know that this is achondroplasia and somebody said, is it hypochondroplasia? You look at the interpedicular distance is abnormal at L4 in achondroplasia and is normal in hypochondroplasia if you believe in an entity called hypochondroplasia. So this is gestalt, homework, why it is called gestalt. And I told you why it's called aren't many. Homeworks are good. <coughs> Because once you start reading about why is it just told, you read a whole lot of other things and something uh, beyond medicine. I mean, it's important for a physician to know something beyond medicine because you're dealing with human beings, not AI. Anyway, so next one is depending upon the location. These are the three locations. Now let me hurry up. This is an osteochondroma, bone growing out of bone, homework for but you look. Why is it happen? that an osteochondroma always points away from the joint. I mean, this is common sense. You don't even have to read. You just have to think. Why does it happen that without exception, if there are one osteochondroma or three osteochondromas, the one in the tibia will point down, the one in the femur will point up. Why does it happen? And there's a whole lot of radiology imaging involved in telling when a, chondrosar when a chondroma becomes a chondrosarcoma. And that is important, but we don't have time to go into that. That can be a tumor board separately. Some of your colleagues can teach you when that happens, what imaging you have to do to tell that important difference between a chondrosarc and a chondroma. So this is one osteochondroma. Also see the modeling defect. This is something you have to pick up because this may be the only, th only abnormality. We use the word non-tubulation. It does not become like a normal tube. You can look at the tibia, it becomes tubular. You look at the femur, it remains white. So whenever there is non-tubulation of bone in any situation, it's dysplastic, it's abnormal. It may be significant, it may not be significant, <coughs> but non-tubulation of bone is a modeling defect. <coughs> this is our friend, bumpy bones. And there is again a whole lot of clinical evidence. I used to ask radiology residents, if your child has osteochondroma, two-year-old child has osteochondroma, how do you know that there are no other osteochondromas? In the 1980s, they said, we will do more x-rays. In the 1990s, they said, we will do an MR. And today, they say, we'll do a PET scan. That's how brainless you can be. The best person to tell you if there are other lumps and bumps is the patient's mother. She gives birth to the child, she is concerned, and she will be able to tell you if there are reasonably big osteochondromas elsewhere. There is no substitute for clinical medicine. William Osler, listen to the patient, he is telling you the diagnosis. No, no matter what imaging, I mean, I'm a radiologist and I hate imaging because that has taken clinical medicine out of our hands. I was talking to a very senior faculty in KEM, I said, why don't you teach them how to stand with the patient on which side, how to palpate the liver and spleen? He said, Ravi, tu pagal ho gaya kya? Ultrasound karega, kai ko loko sikane ka? This is senior, extremely competent surgeon at KEM and I felt like slapping him. It's not about making a diagnosis. Some of you will want to read Abraham Verges. He is professor of medicine at Stanford and he takes lectures called Stanford 25 and he talks about clinical medicine. And he gives examples after examples and he says that the most important diagnostic tool in all of medicine is the hand. There's nothing that can replace the hand as far as diagnostic tools are concerned. I'm coming down to five minutes. Let me hurry up. 
So this is multiple osteochondromas that are modeling defect almost certainly. This is diaphyseal ecclesia. Now this is important, so I have to spend some time on this. Look at the metaphysis of this. They are sclerosed, they look like rickets, but they are not rickets. How do you tell? Now, this is important because all of these children, but 27 physicians and surgeons, will get treated with truckloads of vitamin D, which they don't need. Some of them will get vitamin D toxicity. How do you tell the difference? Look at the sclerose metaphysis, look at the normal density of bones, and look at rickets. The important difference here is that this zone the place between the epiphysis and the metaphysis is called by different, different names. But if you read Arthur Ham's histology, the only correct name for it, histologically correct name for it, provisional zone of calcification. It is not zone of provisional calcification. He makes a very important remark. There's nothing provisional about that calcification. So this is the provisional zone of calcification because you have less vitamin D, and calcium, this zone keeps widening. You do an MR, you'll see that space, but it does not get calcified and therefore you don't see it in rickets. So the brush border appearance, decreased bone density, all that is something that will help you, but this one, this finding will tell you that this is rickets. You can do all the biochemistry that you want. And metaphyseal dysostosis, this one, you don't see such changes. Of course, there are other differences, uh, you can do the labs and tell the difference, but because these children get vitamin D, you don't know what's going on in those patients. Metaphyseal dysostosis is something that needs no specific treatment except counseling in terms of hereditary transmission. If there are bent bones, of course, you'll want to operate and correct that. Otherwise, this is important because you don't need to give vitamin D to these patients. <clears throat> now, let me skip this. So this is what I wanted to say, that please be careful about rickets before calling them rickets. Be, be careful about metaphyseal dysostosis. There are multiple varieties of metaphyseal dysostosis that is for textbooks. Now, I want you to look at, so one of the, down to two minutes, uh, one of the important uh, radiographs that you do in scleral dysplasia is to look at the hands. I insist on that all the time. Least radiation, easiest to perform, and you look at the base of the metacarpals, okay? This one. This is nice and normal and broad, and contrast that with this one. You have conical proximal lens of metacarpals, just one radiograph, and this is classical of some form of MPS, mucopolysaccharidosis. This is a common thing in our practice. You'll see patient after patient who has MPS. You don't need to do any enzyme study. You just look at the radiograph, funneling of the base or the conical base of the metacarpals, and you know that this is an MPS. Now, this is important for you all. You have a patient with MPS, like say, for example, Mockio's disease, they have large heads, they have platybasia, I'm sorry, they have platyspondyly, that means the vertebrae are small, flat, and they have AADs, atlantoaxial dislocation. Look at this. This is the posterior arch of the atlas here. This is the posterior arch of C2. This whole thing has gone forward. Most of the time, in spite of a mobile AAD, nothing happens to these patients till they fall off somewhere and they become quadriplegic. I've seen one such patient in KEM. Perfectly walking, talking, these are normal children, uh, very naughty, very intelligent. They come into your room, the first thing they grow is to play with the computer. These children will, can become quadriplegic. Therefore, it's my personal opinion that the moment you see a Marcos disease, you do these radiographs and convince the mother to have at least a soft collar. To give collar to these kids is not easy because they just won't tolerate it. But I feel that just from that one experience, the literature also says that they can become quadriplegic. You have to decide for yourself what is right. But there is an issue of atlantoaxial dislocation in these patients. I will move on. 
This is osteogenesis imperfecta. I talked to you about thin bones always heal with exuberant callus. Oh, this is clippal file. Okay, this is important. So I have shown you, like for example, the Big Ten, I talked about MPS, uh, proximal narrowing of the pro uh, Give me two, three minutes, I'll finish off. Um, we talk about conical metaphysis, metaphysial dysplasias, how to differentiate that from rickets. Fibrous dysplasia is ground glass appearance, achondroplasia, inter interpedicular distance, osteopetrosis, Akash diagnosis, uh, clipper file is simple as routine practice. Diffusial ecclesia, we talked about it, so important to tell the difference from multiple osteochondromas and rib vertebral dysplasias is something that you see in day to day practice, children or adults with uh, scoliosis. Now, this is something to me is very important. You see, skeletal dysplasias is not just about limb lengthening. It's not just about osteotomies to correct angulation. It's not about correcting crooked spines. It's much, much more than that because this is what we are dealing with. We have a sick baby on your left. She had what was thought to be scurvy and she turned out to have um, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. We know about hyperreflexia in that. Then you have this child with innocent smile on the extreme right, and he said, if I go to school, all my friends call me Joker. Please do something about that. And then you have this son, one boy, who said, I can't get into the school bus. Why don't you help me reduce weight? You keep going in that, you have this mother, look at the helpless look on the face of the mother. The innocent look of a child with dwarfism on your right. Hypochondroplasia is the diagnosis that we made. These are the patients who confront you, their parents confront you and they ask you difficult questions. This is a child on your right with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. She is making fun of her finger, hyper extensibility. She does not know that as she goes into her 20s, she can get aortic dissection and die. A lot of innocent playfulness in some of these children. How do you explain this to the mother saying that this can happen? I should warn you. And I'm, as clinical people, you know that. When you talk to the parents about these children, somehow make sure that the children are not within earshot. Because these children have gone to physician after physician and are listening to what the doctor is telling. So if I say this in front of this child, we have no idea what will happen to the children. So this is something I need not tell you, but I thought I should tell you because I learned the hard way that this is something you have to make sure that the children are not in the room when you talk about prognosis or further siblings to the parents. This is my last slide. This is the mother who was told that you cannot possibly have normal children. Most of your child, children will have osteopetrosis. We are doing a documentary for KM Hospital and this was being filmed, the whole discussion was being filmed and this is how <coughs> tears flowed down her cheek. So as uh, someone who deals with skeletal dysplasia, even as a radiologist, I have to face these situations. I'm sure when you talk to them about treatments and treatment options, the situation is going to get only worse. I've been talking about skeletal dysplasia for God knows how many years. At least 200 radiology residents for 25 years, and I still get these things. Sir, what do you think? Sir, what do you think on emails? Thank God I'm not on WhatsApp. Therefore, I have no doubt at all that there is a need for all of us to start with people who work with genes, to carry on with pediatricians, and then you come to the endocrinologists and orthopedic surgeons and radiologists for all of us to work together and find our own solutions for Indian patients. And I told you why it is important for us to work for Indian patients and not always follow Western textbooks. What we need to do 
is to sit and have what I would like to call as dysplasia dialogues. Once in three months, we call everyone together in Bombay, meet in a hospital, keep this child psychologist with us, get patients into that room, see the patients and find, and you are aware of tumor board meetings where everyone sits and takes a decision. We have our collective experience that way in breaking new ground, creating a path by walking, because that is what Dr. Dolakia did. And as we go along, I'm being very, very optimistic. In two, five years, when you have these dysplasia dialogues every three months, once a year, we can have Dolokia Memorial dysplasia dialogues as an annual event and create new paths because that's what he did. He broke new ground wherever we went. I really do hope that we can do it. Thank you. Yes, yes. Go, 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 go. I'm telling you, go, go, go on stage, please. The good thing about talks like this is that there can be no questions. So I'm done. Can I go? <laughs> Thank you very much, sir, for the informative and educative lecture. Uh, yeah. Can we have the BOS would like to present a small memento to you, sir? I always look forward to the memento. <laughs> <laughs> Our honors. That was indeed a wonderful session, a lot of learning for all us bachus. We keep learning as we grow in orthopedics. We move on to the next session, which is the Veteran Surgeons Forum, which is a scientific paper, which is presented by a senior member of the Bombay Orthopedic Society over the age of 45, and probably reflects the work he's done over a lifetime. May I now call upon the two chairpersons of this session, Dr. Sangeet Gawale and Dr. Ram Prabhu, to chair this session.